Hello everyone, I hope you are all doing well and I hope you are having an amazing summer break if you are still on the break, um, enjoying the last few weeks of it that is, before you go back to school in September. And for those of you who are already back at school, I wish you a very great term ahead and I hope that you have fun. For those of you who are preparing for the October November exams, I hope that you're checking in regularly because I am going to be posting more questions for you to attempt on the community channel, um, on the community tab of the channel and I'd like for you to just post any questions you have from any paper under that and I'll then do a video which is what this is actually so I posted on the community tab that all students who are preparing for the October November exam should attempt the May June 2019 paper 2 um, that's the paper 2 version 1 and I got this question from Amira where she said um, I'm not sure if Amira is a lady or a guy uh, but Amira basically it said that she wasn't really clear about question 1b and would also like some explanation on question 3 um, so I'm responding to her by doing this video and I'm very thankful for Anish as well who has sort of help her, helped her to clarify how you can differentiate between the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Nevertheless, I'll tell you how to identify the Golgi body um, and I hope that this is helpful and we will then go into question three together um, just so you get some clarification on how that works. So for those of you who are watching this, I just hope that you also attempt some of the questions I'll begin to post or some of the papers I'll begin to post on the community tab just to get you into a practice mode for biology as you start to prepare for the October November exams. All right, so let us answer Amira's question, question 1b. Um, so over here, the question Amira asked was, how do I know that X is the Golgi body as it says in the mark scheme? So I'm just going to do a drawing for you here so that you can see what the difference is. Whenever you're looking at the rough endoplasmic reticulum, it is more continuous. It looks something like this. And I know again, this is not my strong suit. Um, drawing in particular, but the rough endoplasmic reticulum looks something, um, the endoplasmic reticulum rather looks something like this. And if it's the rough ER, just like Anish said, you would have ribosomes sitting on it. So you'd see like lots of tiny dots on it. The Golgi body, on the other hand, doesn't have this continuous um necessarily have this continuous um form the golgi body yes it also looks like the rough endoplasmic reticulum but what you would see or notice in many of the electron micrographs that you're given is that it looks something like that so can you see that so it it sort of has like individualish um structures that are still sort of together and you can see like in between them you might be able to see like some vesicles or some sloughing to just show how they are um sort of connected to each other but most of the time the endoplasmic reticulum looks more continuous than the Golgi body. I'm not sure if that helps and I really hope that it does. Um something else that you might notice with the endoplasmic with the um, Golgi body is that it's usually not very close to the nucleus um, on its own. The rough and the plasma reticulum for some reason tends to be closer, uh, but in this image you can't see that. So you just need to look at all of these and you can see that they are standing individually. Can you see that? So this is one structure here. I'm just going to circle it with my red pen. That's one over there. This is another one that seems to not be fully joined to the previous one. So that is how you know that this is the Golgi body. Okay, to the more interesting question. Um, this is a long question and thankfully my students attempted this before they wrote their exams. Oh, speaking of exams, I hope that those of you who wrote the major exams did really, really well. If you did, um, I mean, I'm very proud of everyone who has written the exam. But if you know that you've done, you know, well, please post your results in the comments. Um, if you got an A, a B, a C, I mean, just let us know. Even if you got a D, um, as long as you feel like you give it your best effort please um, do share that with us all right let's look at this one um, it says new trace is an enzyme that is used to hydrolase proteins in solution now whenever you're given a question with a lot of detail like this my first advice is take your pencil while you're in the exam and start to underline or jot down key thoughts that come to you immediately so for me here where it says nutrase is an enzyme that is used to hydrolase proteins hydrolyzed proteins rather first thing that i would just write is that breaks down proteins okay 
um, so that you don't get confused. Because also sometimes when you guys write the exams, I feel like some of you get really hungry or really tired. And so um, you might just confuse certain words. So hydrolyzed means it breaks down proteins in solution. When the enzyme is mixed from is mixed with a 2% protein solution, the reaction changes from white to colorless. So this means that when the, ends, when the protein is broken down, so this would be a full protein. I'm just going to write it as FP. And this would be a broken down protein. So I'm going to write that as BP. Okay, so it means that when the protein is broken down, the final color will be colorless. And then it says a student carried out an experiment to find the effect of copper sulfate and potassium sulfate on the activity of nutrase. In other words, they're trying to check if copper sulfate and potassium sulfate act as inhibitors or enhances, if possible, of nutrase. So nutrase is the enzyme here. Then it says the Senate made four reaction mixtures in test tubes A to D. Test tubes A to C contained equal volumes of protein solution and 0.1 cubic centimeter um, of solutions of copper sulfate and potassium sulfate. Test tube D contained the same volume of protein solution and 0.1 cubic centimeter of water. This means that D is your control. Okay, so D is a control experiment here because it has water. All right, and then here it goes on to say 0.5 cm cube of 1% um, nutrate solution was added to test tube A and immediately placed into a colorimeter. A colorimeter. The colorimeter was used to measure the intensity of light that is absorbed by the solution over 100 seconds. The procedure was repeated with the other reaction mixtures B, C, and D, and then the results are shown in figure 3.1. So this is what the results looked like. Now, this question might be confusing for some students because they might say, well, what is a colorimeter? A colorimeter is an instrument that is used to measure absorbs absor absorbance or transmittance. Absorbance means that the solution that you put in the test tube is able to absorb light. And if it absorbs light, then that gives you an indication of some kind of reaction, depending on what you're looking for. If you look at this graph, and we're going to look at it again in another slide, you can see here that um, this is the absorbance on the y-axis, and this is the amount of time on the x-axis. So obviously, here's what happened. Let's look at solution A, for example. Solution A had, um, it had copper sulfate, okay? So it had copper sulfate, and it also had protein. So here we had copper sulfate in solution A. Okay, then we had the protein, which um, that's the concentration of the protein, by the way, 0 0.05 mole per dm cube. Um, so the concentration doesn't necessarily mean that the volume um, is different. This is the volume. The volume is 0 0.1 cubic centimeters, but of a different concentration, if that makes sense. So this is for test tube A. All right. And then we added nutrase, which is our enzyme that breaks down protein to this solution. I'm just going to write it as new. All right. And then we put that solution into a colorimeter and over 100 seconds, we decided to measure the absorbance of light. OK, so a colorimeter shines light. I don't know if I, there's a way for me to draw it, but imagine this is your test tube and you have your solution here in the colorimeter, which is usually closed. There is a light source. So I'm just going to draw the light source here and just say that's the light source. And the light source is sort of transmitted and it hits that test tube. Obviously, the test tube is glass. It's transparent. Um, so it hits the test tube. And there's a certain amount of that light that will be absorbed in here and a certain amount that will travel through the test tube. The amount that is absorbed is what now makes up this value here. And the amount that travels through is considered the transmittance. And I know this is a little bit annoying for those of you who are like, why on earth are we doing this? It's more like a physics question, but I hope that makes sense. So the amount that travels through is the transmittance. The amount that is absorbed by the solution is the absorbance. So I hope that makes sense. So now we take solution A and at zero seconds over here, we can see that the absorbance is somewhere around, let's say that's maybe 1.3. All right, let's just assume. 
um, and then obviously don't assume in the in the exam if you're asked to do this in fine detail I'm just saying this just to save time and then at 10 seconds we can see that it still sort of stays the same and it stays constant throughout so what that tells us is that a is absorbing light consistently over the 10 seconds B has a bit of a different um, trajectory and if you look at C and D they also have a different trajectory so that's just to give you a preliminary explanation if you want to now go on and attempt the question yourself before you watch the next part of the video please by all means pause it try the question and then see what the answer is I think that would be really great all right, so I've put question A1 and B together just so I could save slide space. Uh, but A2 is on the next slide, and I'll explain how it works. So over here, it says, suggest and explain why measuring the absorbance of the reaction mixture over 100 seconds is a suitable method for determining the activity of nutrase. Now, remember in the question, you were already told that nutrase breaks down proteins. And when it does that, the solution goes from white to colorless so if the solution is going from white to colorless you can already sort of determine that a colorless solution such as water will absorb less light because it's you can call it transparent in a way so light would more or less shine through it right right through it whereas if it's a white solution think of having a glass of water on your desk right now and having a glass of milk your glass of milk is a white solution so if you shine light through your glass of milk it is likely to absorb a lot of that light but if you shine light through a glass of water the light is likely to come through the other end because water would not absorb so much because water is transparent so a suitable reason or a reason why this method is suitable is that it helps us to see if indeed the reaction has occurred and I know it doesn't say it that exact way in the in the mark scheme but I'm sort of getting you to understand why the mark scheme says what it says so from white to colorless you can determine how much light is absorbed and you can sort of use that to determine the rate of the reaction or if the reaction is even happening at all so that's a good way to think about that question for question B, it says nutrients can be immobilized in alginate. By the way, this is an experiment you need to know how to do. So if you haven't done it or you haven't practiced it, please ask your school teacher to set it up for you because you might get into a paper three and be asked to do an immobilization experiment. And it's always a good thing for you to know how to do it before you go in. So it can be immobilized in the alginate. Immobilized in nutrients is used in the food industry to produce foods with high nutritional content. What is the advantage of using immobilized enzymes such as nutrates compared with using the same enzymes free in solution? When you immobilize an enzyme, you basically put a protective shell around it. That protective shell does not hamper the activity of the enzyme. So let's think about it this way. I enjoy drawing even though I'm so bad at it. But now let's say that this is our nutrase. When you immobilize nutrase, you can form, let's, I'm just going to draw something really weird you can form a shell that maybe looks like that around it now around this shell there are still holes okay so if i were to use the eraser don't know how oopsie that didn't work um but they're like maybe some kind of hole so let me draw it differently let's say this is the shell so they are pores and let's not call them holes let's call them pores they are pores through which the substrate is able to travel to the enzyme it can be acted on and the products can be released and leave through these pores however what the shell does which is the immobilization what it does for the enzyme is that it protects it from ph changes it protects it from temperature changes for example that might denature the enzyme and it also ensures that the enzyme can be reused um, for the same process over and over again and it makes the enzyme easy to recover from solution so instead of having the enzyme for example if you were to take yeast and you put it in bread once the reaction or whatever is done and the flour is reason there's no way for you to separate the yeast from the bread right but if there was a way to immobilize it the yeast might be able to you might be able to recover it as maybe um, a bead which is what is sometimes done in the beer making industry but that's just to give you some background so that would be the advantage of using immobilized enzymes
Now, the question that you, I believe um, you all want an answer to, that I believe Amira might have been struggling with, is this one. So it says here, describe the effects of copper sulfate solution and potassium sulfate solution on the activity of nutrase, and then suggest explanations for the effects that you have described. So now, I haven't looked at the mark scheme. My student tonight did this in class um, before their exams, so I sort of remember how we worked through it but um i hope that i i match the mark scheme which i'm very confident that i will but anyway let's have a look at it so we already said that this is absorbance over here on the y-axis all right this is our these are our absorbance values and these are four different solutions if you remember correctly we said that d is the control um, which means that d has um the protein it has the protein, it has nutrients, and it has water. So it doesn't have any potassium sulfate or copper sulfate. Now we know that nutrase takes the protein from a solution of white to colorless. And obviously if a solution is colorless, it will absorb less. So let's look at D, which is our control. So over here, D, it starts with an absorbance um, at zero seconds of about 1.3 and then by the end of 100 seconds the absorbance is at about 0 0.2 which means that the solution is absorbing less light because it has become colorless all right so that means d has gone through the natural path while c has also followed the same path um while b b and a on the other hand seem to have struggled a bit what does this tell us about the effects of copper sulfate on the solution First things first, it means that copper sulfate affects the activity of nutrase because these solutions A and B maintain a relatively higher absorbance value at the end of 100 seconds compared to C and D. What that means is that the nutrase that is in A and B is being affected by something. The nutrase in C and D, for example, in C we put in potassium sulfate um, and the nutrase seems to have just worked just fine. The absorbance went down from 1.3 all the way to about 0 0.2, which is similar to what the control experiment showed where we have just nutrase and protein without any possible inhibitor so here in this case the question says to describe so again when you're answering questions in CIE pay attention to the action words describe the effects of copper sulfate solution if you are describing what you need to do is explain why the graph looks the way it does not explain rather or rather narrate how the graph looks the way it does explanation is a different story so look at this graph for a a maintained a high absorbance value um, at the end of the experiment, which showed that the solution remained white um, and sort of suggests that um, the nutrients might have been affected. That is an explanation for why A maintained this value. But let's, let's just stick to descriptions for now. Uh, B um, had a lower absorbance value at the end of 100 seconds compared to A, um, and while C and D um, followed the same trajectory and had low absorbance values or relatively low absorbance value at the end of the experiment. What are the explanations for this? I've already alluded to them, which is for A, um, the actions of nutrients seem to have been affected or inhibited by the concentration of the copper sulfate because A tends to, seems to have maintained a white color, which means that the protein sort of remained intact. With B, on the other hand, the lower concentration of copper sulfate um, had an effect on nutrients, but not as high as the effect it had in solution A, and that's obviously because the concentration is lower. As a result, the reaction was slower, because you can see there, but also at the end, compared to the control, you can tell that the protein still sort of stayed intact, and that suggests that copper sulfate affected the activity of nutrients. If you look Look at potassium sulfate because it follows the exact same trajectory as the control experiment you can then say potassium sulfate had no effect whatsoever on the activity of nutrients because at the end of the experiment the absorbance value of, t of test tube c was very similar to that of test tube d and that would give you full marks i believe i believe this was a five mark question so yeah that would make it full marks for you so Again, something else to point out, if you have a five mark question, make sure you list out at least five points so that you can get four marks for that. So yeah, that is question three. And I hope that 
this explanation was clear um, and i hope that you sort of were able to walk through it if you have any questions again just post them um, out um, under this video or you can post them on the community tab and i'll be able to answer them um, for the next video i'm going to do a paper five because i know that's a paper that many students struggle with and i'd like to help you prepare for that one as well all right then until the next video have a good time everyone